All right, at this point, I'm going to ask the president of Chafer Theological Seminary, Dr. George Meisinger, to come up and officially uh, welcome you to the conference, and then he's got less than four minutes to do that, and then we will begin our first session. Dr. Meisinger. That's the problem when you follow a preacher. There's no time left. <laughs> Well, we at Schaefer Seminary would like to welcome you all to the conference. We're really excited. This is a record crowd for us. And for those of you that are going to Dallas Seminary, you're welcome to stay. Anyway, <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is to have all the governing board members, faculty, and students that are involved with Schaefer Seminary just to stand for a moment so... You can ask these people anything you want about the school afterwards, but if you're a faculty, governing board, or a student, would you please stand for just a moment? All right. Your faculty. These two men up on the stage are also involved with the faculty. If you have questions about the school, uh, be sure to ask them. The... Uh, Distinctives of our seminary, I'll go over with you at a later time when Robbie leaves me more time. And uh, people often ask the question, why should I go to Schaefer Seminary? I mean, there are a lot of seminaries out there. Why Schaefer? And we believe that the distinctives on which our school was built supply the answer to that question. But for now, I'll turn the mic back to Robbie, and he can introduce our speaker. Well, for some of you, we have a speaker who needs no introduction. He is my longtime Arminian friend. <laughs> See, those are the ones who know him because he's not. No. Tommy and I first met the first day of my second year, his first year at Dallas Seminary. Randy Price, who's now Dr. Randall Price, uh, introduced us. So we have been friends for a long time, and we even wrote a book together and we continue to be friends. And a mark of a good friendship sometimes is you go through good times, bad times with each other, and you may not always agree on theology, but you are committed to the text and one another's friends. And I'm just proud that Tommy's a, uh, my friend and we've been friends a long time. Um, he is the executive director of the Pre-Tribulation Rapture uh, Research Center, which has now moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, in association with Liberty University, where he is associate professor of theology at Liberty University and Seminary. He currently is teaching classes on dispensationalism and on Daniel and Revelation. Uh, Tommy graduated from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary which is a bonus for both Dallas Seminary and for you. <laughs> we had a great time when we went through seminary. We were the gadfly for a lot of people there. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ice, who's going to be talking on history of Christian Zionism. He has a book coming out on this subject sometime in the near future, if the rapture doesn't come first. I don't need that. I don't want that. But I got this water. It's right here by the anointing oil. <laughs> what? Okay. Right here by the anointing oil. I guess they must use that for healing services <laughs> and things. But now Robbie knew me. I knew I've known Randy Price for. I guess 35 years, first time I met him, I was a tongue-speaking, Jesus-freak, charismatic. <laughs> Shondale, Andale, help me little Rhonda. I can still do it. But. <laughs> and we got in an argument over tongues. But um, my dad was an Aggie, he still is, and uh, I heard about the Aggie that got the gift of speaking. <laughs> And have you ever tried to talk without a tongue? It's real hard. But nevertheless, those are some of my uh, 
repertoire that I uh, like to use, especially the Aggie demon, you know, there in Matthew 12, the deaf, dumb, and blind one. <laughs> it's good to be back in Texas where you don't have to explain what an Aggie is. <laughs> uh, I, I'm son of an Aggie, but <clears throat> let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you've shown to all of us and the fact that you have shown your grace to your people Israel, and you will in the future as well. And this is a testament to your faithfulness in keeping promises. And as we look at this down through history, uh, I pray that it will uh, inspire us to see your hand at work in history as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've got one question, Robbie. How long? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so y'all going to leave whether I'm up here talking or not, I guess. <laughs> but I am going to be talking about the history of Christian Zionism. It's one of the most fascinating studies. Uh, you know, Zionism is, is the belief of Israel going back to the land, and that is generally thought to be something that is Jewish. I'm getting feedback here. Not from the crowd either. <laughs> and Genesis 12:3 records 20 promises, at least 20 promises, or the first of 20 promises of God's promise to give the land of Israel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And although the Abrahamic covenant contains multiple features and stipulation, it always includes the land promises. A lot of people today want to split off the land promises uh, from the rest of the Abrahamic promises. So do these promises still stand today, or are they outdated or been surpassed by the church? What is Zionism? Zionism is simply the desire for the Jewish people to occupy the land of Israel, and Christian Zionists are Christians who desire for the Jewish people to occupy the land. Now up until, for the last hundred years before Zionism came along and Christian Zionism, Christians who believed that Israel should occupy the land were called restorationist. If you read the older literature, that is the term that what we call Christian Zionists today uh, hold. And here is a Arab who wrote in the Michigan Daily about the dangers of Christian Zionism about four or five years ago. He said, the real support for Israel among conservative Christians lies in a sort of religious extremism. It's interesting. After the 1967 Six-Day War in which Israel grabbed all of Jerusalem, conservative Christian groups celebrated the fulfillment of their biblical prophecies. That's what this is all about, the religious beliefs that Christian right push their support for Israel. I mean, I can't imagine a Muslim sitting here uh, talking about how bad it is to base your views on religion. But that seems to be what he's saying which would not have been so bad except for their religious and high, uh, our beliefs are highly anti-Semitic. You've got to be kidding me. We get accused of, of filio-Semitism all the time. The hope is that Jews will regain the control of the entire Holy Land and restore their kingdom, prompting the Messiah to return. Jews will then either be converted to Christianity or eternally damned. Well, that's true of any person, <laughs> Jew or not. So what lies behind the Christian right support for Israeli actions is not a belief in the existence of a Jewish state, but rather a faith in the eventual destruction of the Jewish people. You know, that's just ridiculous. Uh, but that shows you how people on the left and secularist are spinning this. What did the early church believe about this? Irenaeus, who wrote around 180, 185, said, But when this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months, and sit in the temple at Jerusalem, and then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom. And so he saw uh, a role for Jerusalem, but... He did not see Israel as a distinct entity in the tribulation. And so the early church, uh, as this person says in his doctoral dissertation, 
Uh, what is singularly absent from early millennial schemes is, in other words, premillennialist, is the, the motif of the restoration of Israel. The church fathers from the second century on did not encourage any notion of a revival of national Israel. Let me just add at this point, of the six or seven things that make up the system we know as dispensationalism today, it's not the pre-trib rapture that is the newest. It's the belief in the distinction between Israel and the church that really was developed in the 1800s, more than even pre-tribulationalism. That's the new feature. The medieval eschatology saw a role for the Jews in the future, and it was one of subservience, having been absorbed into the Gentile church. Medieval prophetic thought provided no real distinct future for the Jews as a regathered nation of Israel, certainly little that could be labeled as Zionism. However, toward the end of this era, there were a couple of medievalists who taught some kind of a future for national Israel. And so we see Joachim of Fiori, uh, who is the giant in medieval eschatology, uh, dominated the eschatological beliefs of the Middle Ages, even though some think that Joachim could have been of Jewish descent, his thought is typical of the non-Zionist views of the future when he said the final conversion of the Jews was a common medieval theme, but one of the p peculiar significance to Joachim, notes Joachimist scholar um, Marjorie Reeves, it was popular in medieval eschatology to see a future time in which Rome was to be the temporal capital of the world, Jerusalem the spiritual. The great rulers of Jewish history, David uh, Joseph, Solomon, Zerubbabel were interpreted in a priestly rather than an imperial sense, notes Reeves. And uh, Gerard of Borgo San Donio, uh, about 1255, taught that some Jews were to be blessed as Jews in the end time and return to their ancient homeland. Now, an important thing to remember is in 1290, England expelled the Jews from England because of the medieval crusader spirit of anti-Semitism. It was illegal for Jews to live in England as we move into the Reformation period. England is where the blood libel notion first began, interesting enough. Then you have uh, in the Reformation the flourishing of millennialism and a belief in a future return of the Jews to their land often go hand in hand. This is evident in the second generation reformers begin to fade. Thus, to date, I have not been able to find any reformers who supported the restoration of the Jews back to their land in Israel. Such views must await the post-Reformation era. However, the Reformation in many ways prepared the way for the later rise of Christian Zionist views. Michael Prege uh, tells us the following. The growing importance of the English Bible was concomitant of the spreading Reformation, and it is true to say that the Reformation would have never taken place had the Bible not replaced the Pope as the ultimate spiritual for authority. You know, and that's probably why the, the guy is quoting from the Detroit newspaper thinks that Christian Zionism is unique to Christianity because they've never had a Reformation in the Catholic or the, the Greek Orthodox Church, you see. And they do not have a Bible-based brand of Christianity. With the Bible as its tool, the Reformation returned to the geographic origins of Christianity in Palestine. Uh, it thereby gradually diminished the authority of Rome. So you have the Bible coming to think, into uh, parlance. Now you've got to realize, people, basically for fifth, the first 1,500 years, people did not have the Bible. Just a few scholars had it. About every hundred years or so, one person in the church would learn a little Hebrew. And those that read it tended to read it in the Latin translation of Jerome. And so it, by the time of the 1500s, you have, in a sense, the church getting a hold of the Bible for the first time. And so biblical study as we know it, there, there was that going on in the Middle Ages, but nevertheless, biblical study generally began 500 years ago for the most part. People have only been studying the Bible. So it's not that strange for a view to have been developed within the last 500 years, like justification by faith, um, among other things, or people's ecclesiology, and certainly eschatology. Uh, so the, thus it would be Thus, so it would come to be that the provision of the Bible in the language of the people would become the greatest spur to the rise of Christian Zionism. 
The simple provision of the Bible in the native tongue, which gave rise to their incessant reading and familiarization of it, especially the Old Testament, was the fertile soil that yielded a crop of Christian Zionism over time. See, Christianity up to this time was basically the mass, the 12 stations of the cross, you know, pictures. They didn't know the details of the Old Testament. Uh, They knew creation, the flood, and a few big stories. But it's when they began to learn the details of the Old Testament that you began, the Puritans first developed Judeo-Christianity, as we'll see here in a moment. And that's important. Throughout the Middle Ages, it was popular for those who had the means to attempt a pilgrim to the Holy, pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Upon returning to England, some would write detailed accounts of their journey. These kinds of books were popular during the Reformation and beyond and helped to engender an interest in the land of Israel among the English. Uh, when both scholars and laymen alike, generally for the first time in the history of the church, had the text of Scripture, both Old and New Testaments, more readily available, it led to greater study, a more literal interpretation, and a greater awareness of the Israel of the Old Testament. This provided the atmosphere in which a major shift occurred in England, also on the continent to a lesser degree, from medieval Jew hatred, which led to the expulsion of all the Jews from Britain in 1290, to their invitation under Cromwell to return in 1655. It wasn't just any group of English Protestants that provided a a fertile soil for Jewish restoration doctrines. It was out of the English Puritan movement that, uh, that this sprung. Starting with the Puritan ascendancy, notes Barbara Tuckman, and I'd recommend her book if you had to read one book called The Bible and the Sword by Barbara Tuckman. Uh, the movement among the English for the return of the Jews to Palestine began. Why the Puritans? Puritans were not just dissenters. They were a Protestant sect that valued the Old Testament to an unprecedented degree in their day. Barbara Tuckman tells us they began to feel for the Old Testament a preference that they showed itself in all their sentiments and habits. They paid a respect to the Hebrew language that they refused to the language of their Gospels and of the Epistles of Paul. They baptized their children not by names of Christian saints, but of Hebrew patriarchs and warriors. They turned the weekly festivals in which the church had from the primitive times commemorated the resurrection of her Lord into the Jewish Sabbath. Uh, They sought for precedents to guide their ordinary conduct in the books of Judges and Kings. In fact, Cambridge was a source, Oxford early and later Cambridge, for a lot of uh, Puritan uh, stuff. And Harvard, of course, was founded to be an American Cambridge. And it wasn't until after the Civil War that they did away with the requirement for the Vatican at Harvard to have to give his valedictorian speech in Hebrew. That shows you how much Puritans valued the Hebrew language. Can you imagine giving your valedictorian speech? If you're a valedictorian, you're probably capable. Uh, but <laughs> So the study of Hebrew, the translation of the Bible into English, learning Old Testament stories for the first time, and England especially tended to view themselves Uh, and identify with Israel because uh, they were being uh, supposedly persecuted by those evil Spanish in the other parts of Europe. And and they would say, hey, what's happening to us today is similar to what happened to the children of Israel. And they'd pick out stories, you know, from Chronicles and Kings and Judges and different things and make analogies, not that they were replacing the church with Israel. They would just identify it. We, We do the same kinds of things today. And the Puritans developed Judeo-Christianity. So if you want to blame somebody for that, blame them. They get blamed for a lot of stuff anyway. Uh, So you have Bible study produces millennialism. And then parallel struggles of Israel and England, as I just noted. And Francis Kett, who got a B.A. and M.A. from Cambridge in the 1570s, he was both a pastor and a medical doctor, wrote a book called The Glorious and Beautiful Garland of Man's Glorification Containing the Godly Mysteries of Heavenly Jerusalem, one of the shorter titles of the day. (laughs) And Kett mentioned the notion of Jewish national return to Palestine. As far as we know, he's the first one to explicitly uh, state this and 
As a result, he was burned at the stake on January 15, 1589 in Norwich, England, for advocating in this book the restoration of the Jews to Israel, an idea he claimed to have received from reading the Bible. Imagine that. So it wasn't a very receptive environment at this time. About the same time as Ketch, strict Calvinist Edmund Bunny, I like that name, taught the Jewish restoration to Palestine in a couple of books, uh, The Scepter of Judah in 1584 and The Coronation of David in 1588. See, two events that started moving the Puritans toward premillennialism and restorationism was, number one, the production of the Geneva Bible and its extensive notes. I just got a copy. They came out with a new copy uh, that has them, in, you know, they've reset it and changed the spelling and everything uh, of the 1599 edition, a later edition. came out in 1560, I think was the first edition. And it had notes in Romans 9, 10, and 11 about the restoration of the Jews. And that set off a wave of restorationism and premillennialism. And the second thing that they found was the last five chapters of Irenaeus' uh, Against Heresies, which were tremendous futurist premillennialism. And those two things, because Calvin and Luther were going back to the sources, you know, for Calvin and Luther, the sources were the church fathers and the scripture. And they uh, said that you can't be premillennial because the church fathers weren't. And as they began to f rediscover the writings of the church fathers that had been suppressed in the Middle Ages because of their premillennialism, then uh, premillennialism began to uh, mushroom as they began to read the Bible among the pur uh, Purit not just Puritans, but uh, all almost all branches of Reformed Christianity, including Lutheranism. Then you have, um, as the 1600s arrive, a flurry of books advocating Jewish restorationism to their land began to appear. Thomas Drake released in 1608, The World's Resurrection. Uh, on the general calling of the Jews, a familiar commentary upon the 11th chapter of St. Paul to the Romans according to the sense of Scripture. Now, that's a normal title from back then. <laughs> she didn't even have to read the book after you read the title. <laughs> Drake argued for Israel's restoration based upon his Calvinism and covenant theology. See, covenant theology really wasn't developed, and it was developed on the continent more than in England until the mid-1500s. And so they were using it to show that God kept his promises to Israel back then. My, how the worm has turned. And then two great giants of the area were Thomas Brightman, likely a post-millennialist, and premillennialist Joseph Mead, were both, uh, who both wrote boldly of a future restoration of Israel. Brightman's work, Revelation of the Revelation, now that's a title even Hal Lindsey would approve. <laughs> Appeared in 1609 and told how the Jews will return from the areas north and east to Palestine, of Palestine to Jerusalem and how the Holy Land and the Christian, Jewish Christian Church will become the center of a Christian world. Still Christian, but they're coming back to the land. Brightman wrote, What shall they return to Jerusalem again? There's nothing more certain the prophets do everywhere Confirm it. The Geneva Bible, by the way, you know, says the same thing in, in their notes in Romans 11 about how the, all the Old Testament prophets teach this. And so Joseph Mead's contribution was released in 1627 in Latin and in 1642 uh, in English as the key of the revelation. And there is a uh, copy of the title page, as you can see. And Joseph Mead, often thought of as the father of English premillennialism, was also an ardent advocate of Jewish restorationism to their homeland. They go hand in hand. Postmillennialists, by the way, were also restorationists. That's before they became preterized later on. Uh, momentum was certainly building toward widespread acceptance of English belief in Jewish restoration, but a few bumps on the road uh, still lie ahead. Giles Fletcher a fellow at King's College. How would you like to be a fellow? <laughs> uh, Cambridge and Queen Elizabeth's ambassador to Russia 
wrote a book advocating restorationism. Fletcher's book, Israel Redux, or the Restoration of Israel, or the Restoration of Israel exhibited in two short treaties, short in title, by the way, was published posthumously by the Puritan divine Samuel Lee in 1677. Fletcher cites a letter in his book from the 1606 as he argues for the return of the Jews to their land. Fletcher repeatedly taught the certainty of their return in God's due time. Uh, A key proponent for Israel's future restoration was Sir Henry Finch, who wrote a seminal work on the subject in 1621. Now, Sir Henry Finch wasn't just anybody there. How many of you all have heard of, of Blackstone's legal commentaries? Okay, before there was Blackstone, there was Sir Henry Finch. He did the legal commentaries that Blackstone took and developed even further. So this guy is the father of English law. So he's not just some guy off the street. He's a pretty important person in in England. And he wrote a book called The World's Resurrection or the Calling of the Jews, a present to Judah and the children of Israel that uh, joined with him, and to Joseph, that virulent tribe of Ephraim. Now, when you start putting parent parentheses in your title, <laughs> and all the house of Israel that joined with him. Finch at the time, was uh, the publication of the book, was a member of Parliament and the most highly respected legal scholar in England at the time. And the book had been published for a matter of only weeks when the roof caved in on the author's head. In the persecution which ensued, Finch lost his reputation, his possessions, his health, all precipitated by his belief in Jewish national restoration. Finch's argument may be considered the first genuine plan. He laid out the details for restoration. He taught that the biblical passages would speak of a return of these people to their own land, their conquest of enemies, and their rule of the nations are to be taken literally, not allegorically, as of the church. Imagine that. And King James of England was offended by Finch's statement that all the nations would become subservient to national Israel at the time of her restoration. Finch and his publisher were quickly arrested when his book was released by the High Commissioner, a creation of King James, and examined. Finch was stripped of his status and possessions and then died a few years later. I mean, this guy was at the highest levels of... English society, and it shows the reaction that they had for a guy like him to teach something uh, from the Bible. The doctrine of the restoration of the Jews continued to be expounded in England, evolving accordingly to the inside of each exponent, and finally playing a role in Christian Zionistic activities in the later part of the 19th century and the first of the 20th century. Does anybody know who that is? Oh, John Owen. One of the most handsome men to ever walk the planet. The famous John Owen, who wrote The Death of the Death of Christ. Many Puritans of the 17th century taught the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land. One of the greatest Puritan theologians in England was John Owen, who wrote, quote, The Jews shall be gathered from all parts of the earth, where they are scattered and brought home into their homeland. He was Cromwell's theologian, if you recall. Uh, the, I used to preach these sermons in Parliament back then. The following list of 17th century English individuals who held to restorationism include John Milton, John Bunyan, Roger Williams, uh, John Sadler, and Oliver Cromwell. The doctrine of restoration of the Jews continued to be expounded in England, evolving according to the insight of each per- exponent and finally playing a role in Christian Zionistic activities in the latter part of the 19th century and in the first part of the 20th century. And here is Cromwell's document in 1655 that allowed the Jews to come back to England because the reasoning went like this. Christ can't return until the Jews have been scattered to every nation on the face of the earth And since there were no Jews in England, then England was preventing the second coming of Christ. (laughs) And uh, therefore, not only did they decree that Jews could come back, but Parliament passed money 
to go to Holland and they imported a boatload of Jews right after they passed this, <laughs> to, you know, to come to England. So that is Cromwell's official document, returning the Jews to England. There was a similar restoration movement throughout Europe where the Reformation was strongest, but on a smaller scale. There were a number of restorations in Holland during the time of the Puritan movement. Um, I can't pronounce all these guys' names, but this guy here, Harry Smith, was one of them, <laughs> who served as the French ambassador to Denmark, and he wrote a book wherein he argued for a restoration of the Jews to Israel without conversion to Christianity even. So that's, that's getting uh, very near modern views. In 1655, uh, another Jones guy wrote uh, Good News for Israel, in which he taught that there would be the permanent return of the Jews to their own country, eternally bestowed upon them by God through the unqualified promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, the Dane, a Holger Pali, uh, believed wholeheartedly in the Jewish return to the Holy Land as a condition for the second coming. He even lobbied the kings of Denmark, England, and France to go and conquer Palestine from the Ottomans <laughs> in order that the Jews could uh, regain their nation. There's a number of guys like that. Um, should I talk about the Frenchman or just leave him out? <laughs> no, let's go with the Frenchman. Uh, there's so few of them. Uh, Marcus uh, schemed with the Turkish ambassador in The Hague on a plan to defeat the Pope and trade the papal empire for the return of the Jews to the Holy Land. Now, these guys are really creative, you know. Not a bad change. We'll give you the Pope. For Israel and see you, Jerusalem. Okay. He was arrested in Hamburg, tried and convicted of high treason, and died in a prison a year later. Other European restorations of the air include Isaac Vossius, Hugo Grotius, uh, Gerhard John Vissius, David Blondell, uh, Vassover Powell, um, Joseph Eyre, Edward Whitaker, and Charles Yaren. And now we come to colonial America. Since the American colonies, especially in Puritan New England, were settled primarily by the Englishmen who brought with them to the New World many of the same issues and beliefs that were encircling, uh, circulating in the motherland. Now we all know San Antonio had been around 100 years before those folks showed up on the East Coast. <laughs> but we'll bypass that. San Antonio back then was not a hotbed of Christian Zionism. <laughs> I guess John Hagee's trying to make up for that. Uh, it is not surprising to find many zealous advocates in America for the restoration of the Jews. Perhaps the most influential of the early Puritan ministers in New England was John Cotton. He's one of the few post-millennialists, uh, you know, until Edwards came along, who, following the post-millennials of Brightman, held to the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land. Uh, in addition to John Cotton, early restorations include John Davenport, William Hook, John Elliott, uh, Samuel Willard, and Samuel Sewell, Ephraim Hoot, a uh, Cambridge-trained early minister in Windsor, Connecticut. How far is that from y'all? An hour, okay. Uh, believed that the Jews would be regathered to their homeland in 1650. See, he even set a date. So you didn't know so many fun people used to live in America. And then you have Increase Mather. His father was Richard, who immigrated from England, if you recall. And Increase was born in the United States or the, the colonies. Uh, and he was a president at Harvard. Did I say that right? Yes. And he only wrote 125 books in his life. <laughs> and Increase Mather married John Cotton's daughter, and they named their son Cotton Mather, who 
wrote 425 books in his life. And he is one of the standard advocates of the Restoration Doctrine, was Increase Mather, who was a big-time premillennialist, the son of Richard and father of Cotton, as I said, over, wrote over 100 books, was president of Harvard. His uh, first work was The Mystery of Israel's Salvation, the first book he ever wrote, which went through about a half a dozen revisions during his life. His support of the national restoration of Israel to her land in the future was typical of American colonial Puritans and was generally widespread. So, so America does not have the medieval anti-Semitic heritage that Europe has. And the, fa- the founders of America were pro-Israel, pro-Jewish from the start. And that's one of the reasons why almost one-third of the Jews in the world live in, in the United States. The first salient school of thought in American history that advocated the national restoration of the Jews to Palestine was resident at, at, in the first native-born generation at the close of the 17th century in which Increase Mather played a dominant role. The men who held this view were Puritans, and from that time on, the doctrine of the Restoration may be said to have become endemic to American culture. It was Increase Mather's view that this final and greatest reformation of the Christian world would be led by the Jewish people ensuing upon their restoration to the Holy Land. From the earliest times, American Christianity has always tilted towards support of the restoration of national Israel to the Holy Land. Uh, American Christians who compared with Euro-Asian Christianity had always had a filio-Semitic disposition. Thus, it's not surprising that the tradition continues today, especially in dispensational circles. Now, here you have uh, John Quincy Adams, and it should not be considered strange that President John Quincy Adams expressed his desire that the Jews, again, uh, were in Judea, an independent nation, once restored to an independent government and no longer persecuted. That was part of his his foreign policy, to have Israel restored. George Washington also made a statement on it as well, uh, along the same lines. Abraham Lincoln also made a statement about wishing that the Jews would be restored to uh, their holy land. Then we see the rise of dispensational in John Nelson Darby. Nelson, by the way, he was named after Lloyd Nelson, Lord Nelson, who his, his uh, uncle served under as one of the top admirals in Lord Nelson. People are always wondering uh, where that came from. That's where it came from. He was from an aristocratic family. His mother grew up in Philadelphia, by the way. And the 1800s marks a high point, and she was an aristocratic culture that was uh, living in the United States during the founding of our country. The 1800s marks a high point in British premillennialism. See, there are two great times of tremendous spirituality in, in England. 1620 to 1680, then 1820 to 1880. And those were high-water high marks of British Christianity and evangelicalism and Bible teaching, especially the, in the uh, Elizabethan era, uh, I'm, I'm in the Victorian era, there was uh, tremendous among the wealthy class who uh, had a very strong view of the Bible overall. In fact, by 1848, it was said that over 50% of Anglicans, this is inside the Church of England, were premillennial in 1848. Over 50%. So if they're premillennial, you know they're evangelical, you see. And that was within the Church of England. Now, the 1800s had a high, high mark point in British premillennialism and a corresponding apex for Christian Zionism. Many contemporary accounts critical of Christian Zionism focus their emphasis upon Jay and Darby and the rise of dispensationalism as the foundation for British restorationism. As one examines the record, such is not the case. Uh, Timothy Weber has said that you know Christian Zionism began with Darby and a lot of articles you read say that's ridiculous as you just seen it was going on for 250 years before Darby ever took his first breath 
The real advocates of Christian Zionism in Britain were primarily Anglican premillennialists. By the mid-19th century, about half of all Anglican church, clergy were evangelical premills. Ian Murray said some 700 ministers of the establishment were said to believe that Christ's coming must precede his kingdom upon earth, and that was in 1845. Murray went on to add that the number almost certainly increased in the latter half of the century. And here you have uh, J.C. Ryle. I mean, er, just about everybody who's in the ministry has heard of J.C. Ryle. And he is typical of the premillennial Anglican clergymen in the 1800s. And he wrote something called the premillennial creed. Good Anglican, he wrote a creed. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon signed it, by the way. So if there's any debate over whether Charles Spurgeon was post-mill or, or Premill, there's no doubt because he signed the premillennial creed. An example of uh, such clergy would be J.C. Riley wrote premillennial creed. The wave of premillennialism is what produced in Britain a crop of Christian Zionists that led to political activism, which likely culminated in the Balfour Declaration. And here you have uh, Lord Shaftesbury, who basically took up where Wilbur Wilmerforce left off. You know, the movie there. Of Wilberforce and all of his activity, but Lord Shaftesbury is considered the greatest social reformer in the history of England, even exceeding Shaftesbury, I mean, um, Wilberforce. And this guy would have, you know, he would be right there with us today. A Anthony Ashley Cooper, later Lord Shaftesbury, said, by Tuckman to have been the most influential non-political figure excepting Darwin of the Victorian age. As a strong evangelical Anglican, he is said to have based his life upon a literal acceptance of the Bible and was known as the evangelical of evangelicals. And toward the end of his life, higher criticism was coming in and he used to give talks in Parliament against it, warning them of the higher critical liberal stuff. And they he, they quit inviting him to parties because he would get on rants at the end of his life against liberalism. Shaftesbury was the greatest influence for social legislation in the 19th century in England. And uh, here is uh, Edward Bickersteth. I couldn't find a real picture of him. <laughs> but he, he was a very influential Anglican. Shaftesbury was led into acceptance of premillennialism by Edward Bickersteth which uh, then gave rise to his views of Jewish restorationism. Uh, Bickerseth wrote whole books on Jewish restorationism, Sh uh, big premillennialist, also an Anglican, obviously. Shaftesbury said concerning his belief in the second coming that it has always been a moving principle in my life, for I see everything going on in the world subordinate to this great event. God, this guy's a fanatic. Because of his premillennialism... <laughs> Shaftesbury became greatly involved as chairman of the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews. He basically started the first bishopric in, in Jerusalem and sent a Jewish convert over there to head it up. And his daughter and her husband went over there and worked with it as well. Shaftesbury spearheaded a movement that led to the creation of the Church of England, the Anglican bishopric in Jerusalem with a converted Jew, consecrated as the first bishop. That's still there today, but now they're pro-Palestinian, needless to say. Shaftesbury would roll over, believe me. And, oh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem were the words engraved on a ring that he always wore in his right hand. Since Shaftesbury uh, believed that the Jews would return to their homeland in conjunction with the second advent, he never had a shadow of a doubt that the Jews were to return to their own land. It was his daily prayer, his daily hope. In 1840, Shaftesbury was known for coining a slogan that would often be repeated throughout his life, that the Jews were a country without a nation for a nation without a country. And that was based on the sparse population of the land of Israel at that time. Shaftesbury's greatest uh, contribution to the Restoration Movement was his attempt to accomplish something in the political realm in order to provoke England to develop a policy in favor of returning the Jews to their homeland. He succeeded in influencing England to adopt that policy, but England failed at that time to influence the Turks. In 1838, in an article in the Quarterly Review, Shaftesbury put forth the view that Palestine should become a British colony of the Jews, 
that could provide uh, Britain with cotton, silk, herbs, and olive oil. So this is the theme of Tuckman's book, The Bible and the Sword. In other words, many of these people were driven by the biblical view, but they had to give a political justification, you see. And so uh, there's the political justification. And here we have um, Lord Palmerston, a prime minister. Next, Shaftbury la uh, lobbied Lord Palmerston, who's one of the three greatest prime ministers in the 1800s of England, the foreign secretary, uh, he later became prime minister, using political, financial, and economic arguments to convince him to help the Jews return to Palestine, and Palmerston did so. Uh, what was our, originally the religious beliefs of Christian Zionists became official British policy for political interest in Palestine and the Middle East by the 1840s. This was primarily a result of Lord Shaftesbury's efforts. However, at the end of the day, Shaftesbury's plan failed, but it succeeded in setting a precedent for putting concrete political legs on one's religious beliefs. This would yield results in a later time. Lord Shaftesbury had... I got ahead of myself here. should have only pushed it once. Used his great power of persuasion to sway Henry John Temple Palmerston, to whom he was related by marriage, to the restorationist position. Palmerston had a distinguished political career, serving in government almost the entire time from 1807 till his death in 1865. He served the British government many years as War Secretary Foreign Minister and was a popular Prime Minister for about... 10 years. Even though Shaftesbury influenced Palmerston to hold to the restoration position, it appears that it was a deeply held conviction and not one of mere political expediency. In other words, I'm showing you some of the great British uh, political leaders who held to Christian Zionism. <clears throat> While British Foreign Secretary in 1840, Palmerston wrote the following letter to his ambassador at Constantinople in his attempt to advocate on behalf of the Jews. I tell you what, I'm not going to read that, but he, you know, shows his devotion to it. Shaftesbury was not the only one lobbying Palmerston at the time. A wave of premillennialism had hit the Scottish. Boy, when something hits the Scotch, you better step back. <laughs> Resulting in a growing sentiment toward Jewish restoration. In 1839, the Church of Scotland sent Andrew Bonar and Robert Murray McShane to report on the condition of the Jews in their land. Uh, their report was widely publicized in Great Britain, and it was followed by a memorandum to President Monarchs of Europe for the restoration of the Jews to Palestine. See, those guys, they go right for the juggler. This momentum was printed verbatim in the London Times, according, including an advertisement by Shaftesbury <laughs> igniting an enthusiastic campaign by the Times for restoration of the Jews. 320 citizens of Carlo, Ireland, sent a similar memorandum to Palmerston. Uh, by the way, uh, Robert Murray McShane, you know, died at a young age, and Bonar wrote that book about him. And after Bonar's trip to Israel, for the last 30 years or so of his life, he promised to never preach on anything but the second coming. Interesting for a Presbyterian. One time governor of Australia, George uh, Goller, was one of the most zealous and influential restorationists next to Shaftesbury in the, in the 1840s. Uh, Colonel Goller, oh, I've heard of someone else named Colonel around here, was a senior commander at the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, when he returned to England in 1841, he became a strong advocate of Jewish uh, settlement in the land of Palestine. Galler's uh, restorationism, like most of his day, was sparked by his religious convictions, but he argued for Jewish return to their land upon geopolitical grounds. And I'm not going to read his long quote either. You have it there. Working with Sir Moses Montefiore, a British Jew, he's the first Jewish guy to have rise in England since they came back in 1855 to a powerful <clears throat> um, political thing, and he became uh, the prime minister of Britain later. Galler provided an agricultural strategy for Jewish resettlement of the Holy Land. One of these uh, Montefiore Galler uh, projects resulted in the planting of an orange grove near Jaffa, still existent today, known as Tel Aviv's Montefiore Quarter. So if you want to know why there are oranges in Jaffa, it goes back to there. They, they started it. Charles Henry Churchill, an ancestor of Winston Churchill, was a British military officer stationed in Damascus in 1840, and he was a Christian Zionist. And he supported the Jews against the non-Zionist Christians of Damascus. 
And it was through his efforts that he helped acquaint the Jews accused of the infamous charge of blood libel. Actually, Shaftesbury sent him there or talked the government into sending him there so that he could help protect the Jews who were always being persecuted. In Israel about this time, if the Jews ever started getting ahead financially, then the Turks would come in and tax these people to death or they would accuse them of blood libel and put 10 or 20 to death uh, so that they would always be poor and not have any resources. And so the British government set up an office there uh, at, uh, and sent him there to help the Jews try to live a better life. Colonel Churchill was honored at a banquet hosted by a grateful Jewish community where he spoke of the hour of liberation of Israel that was approaching when the Jewish nation will once again take its place among the powers of the world. And in a letter to the Jewish philanthropist uh, Moses Montefiou, dated June 4th, uh, June whatever, and he wrote about his hopes that the Jews could return to the land of Israel. British General Charles Warren, also known for his archaeological work in Jerusalem, served in Syria on behalf of the Palestine Exploration Fund. In 1875, he wrote The Land of Promise or Turkey's Guarantee, and he proposed that the land be developed with the avid, uh, avowed intention of gradually introducing the Jews pure and simple. He would eventually, they would eventually occupy and govern the country. He even speculated the land could hold a population of 15 million. Not bad for 150 years ago. Then you have Lawrence Oliphant. Uh, and he was an evangelical British Protestant, an officer serving the British Foreign Service, a writer, world traveler, and an official diplomat. And he was passionate about the Jewish restoration to their land that came from his intense religious convictions, which he tried to conceal them behind the arguments based on strategy and politics also. In 1880, he published a book, The Land of Gilead, uh, proposing Jewish resettlement under Turkish sovereignty and British pr uh, protection. And, you know, the, what I'm showing you is that there were many, many attempts coming out of Britain at this time to try to, driven by their Christianity, to try to uh, get the Jews restored there. And there were many other British restorations during the 19th century that created a momentum that would pay off later in British control of Palestine and the Balfour Declaration. Uh, restorationism found a voice in one of the most popular novelists of the 19th century is George Eliot, who was really a woman, uh, penned the influential restorationist novel Daniel, uh, Daniel Deronda. Among the advocates, we may include Lord Lindsay, Lord Shaftesbury, Lord Palmerston, Disraeli, Lord Manchester, Holman Hunt, uh, Sir Charles Warren, uh, Hall Caine, and others. Uh, among the 19th century British, one observes the gradual drift from purely religious notion to the political. These two influences, the Bible and the sword, religion and politics, as Tuckman has put it, would merge into a powerful team that led to the Balfour Declaration, the eventual founding of the Jewish state in the 20th century. There's no doubt that John Nelson Darby believed in a future for national Israel, which would make him a restoration of Christian Zionist theory. However, anyone familiar with Darby and the Brethren knew that they were not involved politically in any way, and their distinctive dispensational views did not penetrate Anglican evangelicals. I, I, I could give you a whole lecture on why no Anglican would be a dispensationalist, uh, basically because the Church of England had a national church, and the arguments for uh, having Parliament control the church were basically made with analogies between Israel and the church. So if you become a dispensationalist, then you lose that argument. And that was one of the two greatest issues of the 19th century. And so when they became dispensationalists when the Church of England, they left the Church of England. They, they left the Church of England because... But there was still a lot of premillennialism in the Church of England. Uh, a number of critics of Christian Zionism say that Darby is a major source of Christian Zionism, and he really wasn't. Darby said that we don't vote. <laughs> they didn't even believe in voting, let alone uh, exerting political influence. And my whole point, uh, and I presented a paper at ETS last year uh, against a Weber's new book called uh, 
can't remember, but it was about how, how, how evangelicals became Israel's best friend. Yeah, all of these books against us are something like approaching Armageddon or heading toward Armageddon. You know, we're all going to produce Armageddon, you know, with our views. But Don Wagner appears to be the biggest culprit in the matter. He says, if Brightman was the father of Christian Zionism, declares Wagner, then Darby was his greatest apostle and missionary. Uh, the Apostle Paul of the movement. Wagner continues this theme when he says, Lord Shaftesbury was convinced of Darby's teaching. Lord Shaftesbury didn't even know of Darby's teaching. Uh, Lord Shaftesbury was led into uh, premillennialism by Bickerstaff. Fellow anti-Christian Zionist Stephen Sizer echoes Wagner's misguided views when he says of Shaftesbury, he single-handedly translated the theological positions of Brightman, Henry Finch, and John Nelson Darby into a political strategy. That's ridiculous. He, uh, Shaftesbury was not at all familiar with Darby. And his biographer talks about the time when he's converted premillennialism when Bickerstaff showed up. I have never found within the writings of the Special of Christian Zionists anyone who makes more than a brief mention of Darby. No one includes him among uh, those who could be considered even a quasi-significant restoration. In fact, Barbara Tuckman uh, considered the most significant and comprehensive treatment of British Christian Zionists does not even mention Darby at all. But when it comes to the alleged influence of Darby upon Lord Shaftesbury, this is the most unlikely. I've already said that. Bickerstaff uh, influenced him. In that year, he first met the man who was to be one of the chief influences in life, Bickerstaff, uh, met Shaftesbury. Uh, that man he had, in all probability, first came in contact with uh, a mode of belief which was to be all important to his view of religion. The man was Edward Bickerstaff, as I've said. Then you have, uh, even though Darby was not really a player in British Restoration, there's no doubt that his dispensationalism, once imported to the United States, would eventually become the staple for most Christian Zionists. And that's where it happened. Most dispensationalists were satisfied to be mere observers of the Zionist movement, notes Weber. They watched and analyzed it, and that's right. And uh, so then he moves on to William Blackstone. William Blackstone in the United States was a... a um, no doubt a Christian Zionist who was influenced by dispensationalism. I want to move ahead past these British guys. Well, we, we've got to deal with Balfour. Uh, Lord Balfour, who was Scottish, uh, was born in Scotland and reared in a strong Christian home. He was not a strong Christian himself. But uh, at, the same with Lord George, who both of them issued the Balfour Declaration, but they grew up in these strong Christian homes and therefore were sympathetic toward uh, Christianity. Uh, Balfour, a lifelong bachelor, even wrote a book on Christian philosophy and theology. I've got it, and it's terrible. <laughs> Just, it's a philosophy. Lord Balfour served much of his life within the highest offices of the British government, including prime minister. His interest in Jewish restoration was biblical rather than imperial. His sister and biographer said the following, Balfour's interest in the Jews and their history was lifelong. It originated in the Old Testament training of his mother and in his Scottish upbringing. As he grew up, his intellectual admiration and sympathy of certain aspects of Jewish philosophy and culture grew also, and the problem of the Jews in the modern world seemed to him uh, of immense importance. He always talked eagerly on this, and I remember in childhood imbibing from him the idea that Christian religion and, and civilization owes to Judaism an immeasurable doubt, shamefully ill repaid. And that was very common of the, t of the time. People that had a Christian background and they thought the Jews had been uh, sh basically shafted through history, and so they thought the Jews should. Uh, re be returned to their land. And here is the Balfour Declaration that was issued. Actually, Lord George, the Prime Minister, had his Foreign Secretary Balfour issue it, but they wouldn't do it until they got agreement from Woodrow Wilson, who's another case of the son of a Presbyterian minister. Uh, regardless of what you think of Woodrow Wilson and all the bad things that he might, may or may not have done, he had a similar view of support for Israel you know, because he felt that they had been abused, and he supported fully the Balfour declarations, and they brought it forward. 
which says His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national homeland for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of the, uh, this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in other countries. And as I'm running out of time, I want to switch forward to one of my favorite guys. I'm going to switch past, uh, there's Lloyd George um, Herzl. Oh, I can't believe I'm not going to get to deal with William Hetchler, an amazing guy who showed up in uh, Herzl's apartment one day and th flung on the floor a map of Israel and started before he even introduced himself and telling him how they were going to restore the land of Israel. Really interesting guy. And uh, William Blackstone, the American who got petitions going and all kinds of things. But I want to get to the cussing Baptist. <laughs> Harry S. Truman who's an interesting fellow because he played a role, big-time role, in recognizing Israel. President Harry S. Truman grew up in Missouri in a devout Christian home. I don't know where he learned to cuss, but probably not in his home. When Harry was born, his parents were attending a Southern Baptist church, which both sets of grandparents had helped establish in Grandview, Missouri. His father, John Anderson Truman, was also a strong Baptist. Both his father and mother, Martha, raised him in the conventional Baptist tradition. When Harry was six, his family moved to Independence, and they attended the First Presbyterian Church at Lexington uh, and Pleasant every Sunday until Harry was 16. There was no Baptist church in town. When Harry turned 18 and moved to Kansas City, he joined the Baptist church by baptism and remained a Southern Baptist the rest of his life. Truman said, I'm a Baptist because I think that set gives the common man the shortest and most direct approach to God. <laughs> that was the sanitized edition of the quote. Just kidding. <laughs> While growing up, Truman read the Bible through twice by the age of 12 and two more times by the age of 14. Truman was an avid reader. From Sunday school and his own reading of the Bible, he knew many biblical passages by heart and could quote many Bible verses at random. Young Harry was an avid reader and remained so throughout the entire life. The Truman family owned a set of great men and famous women edited by Charles Francis Horn. According to Truman's daughter, Margaret, the book Truman preferred most after Horn's biography was the Bible. There's even an indication that Truman considered entering the ministry for a long time. Every indication reveals that Harry and his sister Mary were very active in the church throughout their late teens and early 20s. What about Truman's Christian beliefs? Truman had little interest in theological issues, although he had an almost fundamentalist reverence for the Bible. Blending Truman's greatest interest in history and the Bible, he once stated the following about the United States. Divine providence has played a great part in our history. I have the feeling that God has created us and brought us to our present position of power and strength for some great purpose. It is not given to us to know fully what that purpose is, but I think uh, we may be sure of one thing, and that is that our country is intended to do all it can, incorporating with other nations to help create peace and preserve peace in the world. It is given to defend the spiritual values, the moral code, against the vast forces of evil that seek to destroy them. I'm sure most Democrats today would give a hearty uh, no to that today. While premillennial eschatology dominated the Southern Baptist uh, denomination, the church into which Truman was born and to which he returned when he was 18, never, he never expressed his acceptance of premillennialism. It is even doubtful that he even adequately understood it. Truman's Christian focus was on the ethics of everyday living and tended to shy away from theological systems. In other words, he was a forerunner of basically the, you know, the living by the Sermon on the Mount type stuff was his emphasis. Truman's Christian Zionism was a combination of his attraction to the people of the Bible, the Jews, that 
grew out of his familiarity of biblical details with humanitarian concern for a persecuted people. The stories of the Bible, said Truman, were to me stories about real people, and I felt I knew some of them better than actual people I knew. That's probably <laughs> true. <laughs> his Christian Zionist beliefs were well, well developed and deeply rooted long before he became president of the United States. Presidential uh, counsel Clark Clifford tells us that Truman's own readings of ancient history and the Bible made him a supporter of the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, even when others who were sympathetic to the plight of the Jews were talking of sending them to places like Brazil. He did not need to be uh, convinced of Zionism. All in all, he believed that the surviving Jews deserved some place that was historically their own. I remember him talking about once about the problem of repatriating displaced persons. Everyone else who's been dragged away from his country has some place to go back to, he said, but the Jews have no place to go. Truman's Christian Zionism came into play during two of the greatest decisions that he would have to make during his presidency. But isn't, isn't it interesting how, uh, you know, FDR, you know, f was elected four times and he had a different vice president every time? And he gets the cussing Baptist here for his fourth one and then he kicks the bucket 60 days afterwards. And according to what I've read, uh, he had only met with Truman twice when he was president, FDR. And he hardly knew him. He probably knew some of those Bible characters better than he knew FDR. <laughs> but it's obvious to me that God put Truman in there, if nothing else, to recognize Israel. Uh, because I have you know, doctoral dissertations from the Hoover Institute and Stanford and all this stuff that analyze FDR, and they all say overwhelmingly and dogmatically, anybody who's ever analyzed the situation, that FDR would have never recognized Israel. No way. Uh, Truman's Christian Zionism, is, okay, uh, first, how should the U.S. vote on the partition of Israel, which would result in the creation of the new Jewish state during the United Nations vote in late November 1947, and second, should the U.S. diplomatically recognize the newly formed nation when Ben-Gurion declared the birth of Israel in May 14, 1948? That's where they did it. And on both issues, virtually all of Truman's personal advisors, the State Department, what a surprise, and the military establishment were opposed to him. Truman's most trusted foreign policy advisors, almost to a man, were dead set against, because he had all FDR's advisors, were dead set against the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. The president faced the formidable front of General Marshall, Under Secretary of State Robert Lovett, Secretary of Navy uh, James Forstall, Policy Planning Staff George Kennan, State Department Counsel Charles Bolin, and Marshall's successor, Secretary Dean Atchison. Uh, Loy Henderson, director of the NEA, who arrived at the uh, State Department just three days after FDR's death, also opposed the Zionist aims. William Yale, also at the State Department, said that the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine would be a major blunder in statesmanship. When Secretary Forstall remained the president of the critical need for Saudi Arabian oil in the event of war, reminded uh, Truman said he would handle the situation in light of justice, not oil. Truman dealt with both issues by applying his the buck stops here approach with tough, responsible decisions. Truman instructed the American delegate at the UN, Herschel Johnson, to announce the U.S. endorsements of the UNESCO partition plan on 11 October 1947. Then, 17 minutes after David Ben-Gurion declared uh, declaration of the new state of Israel, a cable was sent to Israel and a message went to the press from the White House announcing the following. This is in the Truman Archives. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has uh, requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of, and he Truman marked out and put state, new state of Israel. He marked out Jewish state and put the new state of Israel. Approved May 14th, 1948, Harry Truman. And there's all kinds of interesting stories about how everybody tried to uh, lobby Truman. But Truman said in his memoirs he didn't need any lobbying on this. He would have done it without any lobbying. 
Also, you got to realize Truman was the most pro-Israel senator in the Senate. And when they had that ship, I forget its name, in 1945, uh, not the Exodus, that was in 48, 47 rather, uh, that had a bunch of Jews that was going to go to Cuba, and then he made it, they diverted it. Truman tried to pass a bill in the Senate to let that ship come into Israel, I mean into the United States, but it was voted down trying to usurp uh, the State Department. After his presidency, his longtime Jewish friend, Eddie Jacobson, introduced Truman to a group of professors by saying, this is the man who helped create the state of Israel. But Truman corrected him. What do you mean, I helped to create? I'm Cyrus. I'm Cyrus. (laughs) And Truman was comparing himself to Cyrus in the Old Testament who enabled the Jews to return to the land in the 6th century uh, B.C. after their 70-year captivity. So you can see that the Bible has had a tremendous influence uh, in Protestantism. And if it were not for Christian help, we wouldn't have a state of Israel today. Uh, God has, well, maybe God had done it a different way, but nevertheless, uh, that's how he did. Any questions? Yes. Uh, With the plethora of, of Christians you presented to us, that were for the restoration of the Jews in Israel. It's it's intriguing to me that the early Zionist Congress under Herzl were not that concerned about going back to Israel itself. They just wanted the homeland. No, that's not true. Well, at the second Zionist Congress, I'm familiar with that, but Geneva they suggested who got them. Yeah, they suggested it, but they nobody was really for that. They felt they had to consider it. Uh, that was my. Among the Jews at, in, at the Zionist conference, they voted it down like 8, 80%. No, it wasn't. No, I don't, I don't know. It was voted down very strongly. And, and they felt, they talked in committees before that about whether they should even bring it to the floor, but they felt they didn't want to offend the parties, the outside parties, and so they had to bring it to the floor, but none of them really wanted to go back. Would you say that the, that the Jewish movement was as strong for a return to Israel itself as these people that you presented today? I don't think they were as strong as the Christians because the Christians were even more zealous than the Jews for Israel, but by and large, yes. Uh, they read their Old Testament, and uh, that has been overblown, these suggestions to go to other places, in my opinion, from reading, you know, the dozens of books that I've read, you know, about that. Next year in Jerusalem. Sure. Uh, See, the Jews in the West were opposed to Christian Zionism. Because as a whole, because they thought it would affect their status in Western countries. They thought if they formed a nation of Israel, then they would all be kicked out of, you know, England and France and Switzerland and all those other places. The main Jews that immigrated were the Jews in Eastern Europe who were being persecuted. And I didn't get into the Jewish uh, development, but they had rabbis in the early 1800s writing books about how they needed to go back. It was time to go back to Israel and all of that kind of stuff. And then, of course, when the nation was born, they were kicked out of all the Arab or Muslim nations, about eight or 900,000 of them. Yes. Tommy, could you comment just briefly about uh, the Jews? You started to talk to them about, about the Jewish persecution in, in Europe, but they're... Uh, uh, positioning in several of the governments in Russia, uh, Germany, just during World War II in that period. Yeah, what? Well, in World War before World War One, everyone knew that the Ottoman Empire was going to fall, and they had talked about that for 150 years because in the West you had science and technology that was giving the West military superiority that they could not compete with. Plus, right before they discovered oil, you know, there wasn't any such thing as a wealthy Islamic country because Sharia law, you know, impeded uh, development. 
And if there hadn't been the discovery of oil, but of course there there was, you know, you wouldn't have rich Arab cultures, you know. And then the West gets involved in, you know, the the French, the British were worried about the French taking over, uh, to having too much control down in Egypt, so they started getting in. And I didn't even talk about in World War One how uh, Palmerston and Balfour were basically running the British government on their own. And they had almost no support for their issuing for, within the British government for uh, the issuing of the Balfour Declaration and how basically Britain undermined the Balfour Declaration the moment it was given. Britain did not even vote for Israel in 1947. She abstained. Russia voted for Israel just to make the British mad, <laughs> I'm told. And... Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, General Allenby was a good Bible reader, read the Bible every day, and he was the general who was in charge of the campaign. And Lloyd George sent 75,000 extra troops from the European front to General Allenby to make sure that they conquered Israel. And, and that, if that would have been known publicly, that would have been a very controversial decision you know, by the British people. And General Allenby, when they conquered Jerusalem, basically without a shot, the, the Arabs didn't want to have them lobbing artillery shells, you know, into Jerusalem and stuff. Allenby, instead of riding his horse into Jerusalem, walked in. Because he said, the next guy that's going to come into Jerusalem on a horse is Jesus. And you, there are all these famous pictures of Allenby walking into Jerusalem instead of riding like on his horse like they normally did. And so there, the Lord George and Balfour, who were basically, and the guy who was the, the defense minister, were all Christian Zionists, and they were about it. And they were running the war, and they specifically wanted to capture Israel before the French got it. Because everybody know how bad it would have been if the French had gotten it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah, I think at the time of uh, give my hand. I think at the time you have the rise of Jewish Zionism, seventy percent of the Jews in the world lived in, in Eastern Russia, Europe. Eastern yeah. Europe, and every time there was a. Um, Pogrom. Pogrom. Then a whole bunch of Jews left and went to Israel, Israel or, the, or to the West. Yes. But that really is what generated it. Okay, we've got about a 15 to 20 minutes for a break. Limited, limited bathrooms. Wait a minute.